You're tuned into Fork Podcast. This week, we meet Christopher Didion. He shares his journey from his diagnosis with dyslexia at the age of eight to the discovery of his gifts as an entrepreneur and a peak performance coach. So once you find that, you cannot go any other direction than that because that brings you joy. Because what we're talking about here is not happiness. We're talking about fulfillment, which in my personal opinion is so much better than happiness. Hi, I'm Sean Chris Lewis, your host of Fork Podcast, and today I'm here with Christopher Dedian. He is a peak performance life coach, a professional public speaker, and a learning disability advocate. And he drove all the way across town to be here live on Fork Podcast. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. Awesome introduction. Yeah, well, <laughs> you deserve it, man. And we're going to just share exactly all the things and the great things that you're doing for a very particular cause. And uh, we haven't known each other long at all. In fact, we met on Instagram, a very brief conversation on yeah. the phone, a little bit of texting back and forth, and bang, here you are, man. There you go. The so, universe at its work. Yeah, that's it. So we're going to have to figure out how, how this all starts. And I, I believe we'll probably have to take you way back into your, your history a little bit to d- understand exactly how you arrived at being a being a professional public speaker and peak performance life coach. So tell us a little bit about your, your, your past and how this all started. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And once again, thank you for having me here. It's, it's, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun. Absolutely. Man. Like you said, in a small conversation we had, it was just flowing. So I love the energy. That's why I decided to come here with you. So thank you for having me. So the background story, uh, a bit like you said, I'm a learning disability advocate. Uh, the reason why that is, is because I was diagnosed with dyslexia at the age of eight. And from there, my parents kind of found the proper school for me uh, to put me through Vanguard, which is a school in the greater region of Montreal. And it's a school specialized for students with learning disability. So I went through that. And then from there, got to uh, some certain ideas of where I wanted to do my career, studied to become a fireman, got into that field, realized that that wasn't necessarily the best fit for me because I literally picked that field out of fear. Like the first thing I picked, uh, like when I was finishing high school, I realized that, okay, what do I want to be? I'm like, a lawyer could be something that's interesting for me. But I realized after that lawyer, there's a lot of reading and writing. Being dyslexic, not the best the idea for me to go into that. So I started looking for jobs that have not a lot of reading to do or none whatsoever. And firemen is what came about. And I loved it, had an amazing time. But like I said, I actually went into that domain out of fear, out of my fear of reading and writing. Now, back then, I had no idea. This is me being 16, 17 years old, finishing high school. I do not have the mental capacity to assimilate that situation. Only now, the man today that you're in front of you could understand that aspect. So I went into that. From there, realized that I have so much more entrepreneurial tendencies. Wanted to go into business, and I went into real estate as a broker. Went into that field did phenomenally well obviously in the beginning like in any uh business or any entrepreneur could resonate with this took a couple of you know like a year and a half to really start it off after that it really blew up because i put in the work and then from there one day i was actually talking to uh, my speech therapist that used to follow me in vanguard and she called me up to ask me a question about a real estate property and after the the conversation she asked me chris how are you doing and I just went off on a rant. I was like at the top of my real estate uh, at that point. I was in the peak of my career. Finances were going beautiful. Just everything was just perfectly in line. And after I stopped talking to her about that, she's like, oh my God, I'm the keynote speaker at this event put together by the Learning Disability Institute of Quebec. I would love if you come and you tell us your story as a uh, dyslexic going through the education system and as an entrepreneur who's dyslexic. I'm like, beautiful. I love that. I'm like, 100%, I'm in. That same evening, she writes me an email and she writes in the big subject letter, Chris, I don't think that you should do this speech because there's still a lot of people that have a misconception of what learning disability is and what dyslexia is. And you're new in the entrepreneurial field. I don't want you to miss out on certain clientele because of that. Now, this was coming from a place of love because she truly wanted to protect me by saying this. And I wrote back to her. I completely understand. I'm like, Bridget, I'm like, I 100% understand and I agree with you, but I think I should do this speech. I'll call you Monday to talk about it. So Monday rolls around, get on the phone, call her up, and exactly that. I explained that I have to do this speech because the honest truth is if I'm not out there giving the speech, I'm somebody who's fake. 
I'm not helping the school, the, the students that are on the school benches right now. I'm not helping the next generation. And I'm not helping my future kids because we know this is something hereditary. I'm like, I won't be somebody fake. I'm somebody real. So I have to do this. So that's how it kind of really started. I got invited to do that speech. They told me it's going to be about like 200 people in the room. That was like the first real thing that I did. And I had no idea what the, like the speaking industry was. I had no idea of that. I got ready for it because I knew it was going to be something, but I did not know where it was. So I put the time to get ready for the speech, got to the event, opened the door the day of the event, and I look in the room. We're not talking about 200 people. We're talking about over 1,000 people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this was your first uh, public this, speaking gig. This is, this is like, <laughs> yeah, like literally the first big thing. This was probably it. So go in there, obviously, like a normal human being, your heart starts beating, you start sweating a bit more. But at the same time, I'm still comfortable because I know that I put in the work. I'm very work oriented and I'm very structured. So I'm like, listen, um, I've done this work. I, I got this. Like I, I put in the time. So I get up on stage and that's when I'm going to say just like magic happened. I went and it was amazing on the aspect of I truly found the reason why our creator put me on this planet. And I truly believe every single human being has that reason. And this was mine. This you is refer mine. to that as the light, right? And a lot of your content you so, talk yeah, about. I, I do refer, like I have many things I refer to it. So the light is, is one. A gift is the other. Your purpose is the other. So what I mean by this is, like I said, our creator, call him universe, call him God, call him whatever you want, your God, did not put any single human being on this planet without a gift. And now I believe us as humans, our job is to find that gift and to play it in the forefront and to bring it in the forefront. And once every single individual does that, as a society will go forward with more empathy, with more love and a lot better because you're living in your light. You're living with happiness and joy every single day. So all this, I did not know that. But the second I got on that stage, I realized something was happening and I got immediate feedback. As soon as I got off a stage, like 20 minutes, there was a lineup of people. I was the last speaker. There was a lineup of people in front of me shaking my hands that were like amazingly like ecstatic, giving me business cards, taking my business cards. Some people were crying. I'm like, this is what I was getting at. And I had none of this experience. But I knew that this was something that was literally going to change my life. A bit like the fork, right? Mm -hmm. This was a fork in my life that I'm like, something's happening here. So much so that the Ministry of Education was there. I did a work with them after they saw me on stage. Uh, the newspaper Le Devoir was there. They did an article about me. So many other schools were there. And that's how my speaking career started. So they started inviting me to go speak in uh, schools and universities and colleges here, there, and whatever. And how all of this happened, at that specific time, I had hired actually my, my head coach because I personally have eight coaches and mentors. And we'll go into that if you want to. But my, my main coach, and this is the first time I hired an actual coach, I had hired him so he could coach me on becoming the greatest realtor I could possibly be. And this is two weeks in that I started working with him and I did this speech and the speech was actually in French and my, um, my coach is from uh, Vancouver, so he doesn't speak French. He watched this whole speech, which is on my YouTube channel. And after he saw that, he's like, Chris, you hired me that I could coach you to be a great realtor. But he's like, that's not what we're gonna do. He's like, you are made to be a speaker. He's like, I'm gonna coach you to become one of the greatest speakers ever. I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about, Trevor? I'm like, what is this speaking? I had no idea what it was. I'm like, can you even live with this? Like, can you make money out of this? Like, is this a thing? <laughs> I had no idea. And I was, like I said, in a very comfortable place, like financial and all that. I'm like, listen, I don't want to give that up necessarily. And I'm like, well, where are we at with all this? So looked into it and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is what it is. Like, I have to respect my creator's demand of me. And this is how I bring value to people. And like, Sean, you on your end, like you're, like an athletic human being and you train people, this is probably the, the gift or one of the gifts. You don't have just one, but you have several, probably even more than that, gifts that every single person has. And this is one of yours. And your gift is to train people, to get them to a new level of fitness. And then for their whole life is going to be so much better because they're at a fit level. They're more active with their family, whatever the case is. That's your gift, right? So once you find that, you cannot go any other direction than that because that brings you joy. Because what we're talking about here. It's not happiness. We're talking about fulfillment, which in my personal opinion is so much better than happiness. It's the higher level of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm just uh, 
I'm just like chilling back here in the chair, letting you talk. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm really happy about that because in for podcast, I'm I'm really getting a lot of people on here who who it's their first time speaking, yeah. right? And they're I'm shocked at how well people have done so far as a first time speaking. But I find that I have to lean into the mic a lot more yeah. often because they can lose their train of thought. But here I have you in front of me, you're just <laughs> going going on and on. Now you had mentioned some some things about. Um, self-efficacy right people being their best selves so that they can bring them their best selves forward into the world and that helps society to progress and um here's the thing like this this particular podcast when i posted on my stories this morning that i had you on i was hit with so many dms more than any podcast where people were saying i am so gonna listen to this i so need this and I want to make sure that we serve the listeners well with your experience because awesome. it's it's big. What what is it right now about dyslexia, ADHD, ADD that has so many people like anxious to understand it? More of it, yeah. So first of all, I'm completely blessed with everything you said. Thank you very much. And yes, as you noticed, I could definitely go on some solid rants. So that will definitely be rant away, man. I love it. I love it. It makes my job a hell of a lot easier, especially if what you're saying makes sense. Some people go on rants and they don't make any sense whatsoever. (laughs) I'll definitely try to keep it so, you know, in the sensical realm, let's say. So what is it about ADD, uh, ADD, dyslexia that? that... so obviously that's a very vast question, but if we if we refer to the aspect that a lot of people have DM'd you about it today and they want to be more uh, informed about it, I think because in the last couple of years we've been diagnosing more, we've been talking about it more, and all types of you know let's say any type of situation we're so much more averse to conversation now in 2019. So that's why people are more intrigued about it because it's more out there. So people are here about it. Now, when they hear about it, doesn't mean they have the whole definition of what it is. So that's right. why True. that's why people are intrigued. So I think that's like the main reason. And if we talk about like, see, like learning disabilities, essentially, or like dyslexia. Dyslexia is, like I said, a learning disability that has to do based with the language. So people with dyslexia have a hard time with language skills such as reading, writing, spelling, or even uh, speaking or like, you know, talking and whatever the case is. And there's different levels of dyslexia. So now as we go forward as society, and it's so much easier to diagnose, more and more people are coming out with this saying that I'm dyslexic and talking about it openly. So that's why, like I said, the main thing is there's more people interested. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm guessing that's what your question was. Yeah, I think it, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, there's a lot more people obviously discovering. I I had found out mostly about my condition. um, And I want to get into the terminology condition and diagnosis Mm -hmm. with you in a second. But um, just for the sake of this, this part of the podcast, when... I was sitting in with my daughter and she was being, she went to Vanguard yeah. as, as you know, mm-hmm. when I was sitting in on the, on the, the meetings to, to evaluate her, I was sitting in the chair and I was like, Oh my God, me. man, this is yeah. me. We're talking yeah. about me. Yeah. And I remember being put into special classes mm-hmm. back in elementary school and they were not, they, they were not friendly for kids these classes we were ushered out in front of all the other students we were made to feel different Mm -hmm. we caused a lot i caused a lot of trouble was in the principal's office Mm -hmm. quite a lot i was never accused of being a rude bad child but just a kid who just couldn't sit still Mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of the dms that i was receiving were from people like myself who are always looking for a way to understand their condition and navigate it a little bit more effectively and efficiently. Awesome. Awesome. So I love what you just said right there. A couple of points on that. So there is that gap of generation right now. Okay. So I'm blessed enough to be in the generation that the diagnosis started happening. I'm blessed enough to have a great family structure at eight years old. They found out and they put me in the proper places. It's, it's, these are all blessings. Like shout out to Vanguard. Exactly. Shout out to Vanguard. Shout out to my parents, shout out to parents everywhere because phenomenal job, right? Now, that being said, what you just said is exactly the same thing with my parents. Like, I know specifically, oh, my mom probably has this, my father probably has this, or whatever the case is. But my parents immigrated from Armenia coming here. 
they did not have the same situation. They're running away from communism. They're running away from war. It's not the same thing. So they don't have the opportunity to get diagnosed. So that's why so many people of your generation, let's call the baby boomers, mm -hmm. uh, are realizing that, oh my God, I have this my whole life and I did not know. Now they're like, what do I do with this? What tricks do I use? Now, before we go into that, I just want to, the best way I could explain it over here, for anybody that's dyslexic or has ADHD, it's like having a Ferrari motor in the chassis of a Honda Civic. This is what it is, right? <laughs> That's what it feels like. This is what it feels like, right? So your brain is going 100 miles an hour. You're thinking here and there. You said that you're different, which we'll talk about that as well because I truly believe it's an advantage. Now, the job as an individual, as a school system, as whatever, anybody that's giving you tricks and how to deal with this is to get you the proper brakes. So you have that same chassis, which is the Honda Civic. You have the crazy potential of a motor of a Ferrari. All I need to do and all we need to do is get you the Ferrari brakes. Once you do that, sky's the limit, my brother. Sky mm -hmm. is the limit. That's why people look at me and they're like, Chris, how do you like never stop and all that? I'm blessed to be ADHD. I'm blessed to be hyperactive. I'm but it's blessed focused. It's tunneled. That's right? what it is. Yeah. Now, what I mean by that focus, this takes years and years of understanding and using it to your advantage and working on that. Mm -hmm. So how I do that every single day, I wake up at four, I meditate, I go through my thing. Working out is a anchor in my life. So you start with your meditation. Yeah. Um, that could be a shorter meditation. It could be a longer meditation yeah. depending on your time. Yeah. Then you move into, you said you exercise. So, okay, if you want to break it down. So I wake up at 4 a.m., uh, let's say 30 minute meditating. After that, I do my affirmations. So I have a list of my affirmations. After that, I sit down and I write. Well, what's that? What's affirmations? So my affirmations uh, is essentially I am's. So I have a list of I am. So I am love. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a phenomenal human being. Just, I'm it's putting very myself. Important, man. Oh, yes. It's very important. So what happens is I am changing my vibratory frequency right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I meditated, I'm centered, and I'm bringing my vibration to a high level. Mm -hmm. So once I'm at that vibration level, I'm going to connect with other people that vibrate the same way. I completely So agree. this is yeah. what I'm setting up my day. Once that's done, I sit down and I journal. So I set up, first and foremost, what I do is I do my gratitude practice. I write three things that I'm blessed about that I'm grateful for for that day. I write three things that I want to accomplish in that day. That's it. That's all. And I clarify what is my intention for this day. Like this morning on my, on my practice was, I'm super excited to do this podcast. I mm -hmm. want to be so present in the moment with Sean. And I just want to connect with you as a human being. Mm -hmm. This was one of my purposes for today. So if I set my intention for everything I do, that's how you become a highly efficient person. And if you could do that with every single activity that you're doing, I'm talking about results like crazy. Now, after that's done, at this point... I have maybe a bit more time. If I have a bit more time, I'm doing my work. My work only has to do with my self-development. No email, no phone, none of that. I am not doing any firefighting work. What I mean by firefighting work is at 9 o'clock when I'm in the office, usually what I do is I, I put off fires, right? Mm -hmm. Your colleague comes in, your client comes in, okay, do this, do that. You're answering emails. You're putting out other people's fire. Mm -hmm. Before that, I have to take care of myself. Yeah. After that, I go work out. I do CrossFit from 6 to 7.30 do my stretching, then go home. I read the book that I'm reading for about like 10 minutes to 30 minutes and then get ready. And then I'm at the, the office at nine o'clock. That's my setup. That's quite a morning. It you is. sound like Mark Wahlberg. He's <laughs> 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 up at like 3.30 or something like yeah. that. Well, okay. So that's, I, th by the way, I really agree with this. Yes. Uh, not that my agreement is important. However, I think that um, waking up, setting your intention. I'm a little remiss sometimes on the meditation, but I find when uh, my wife really pushed me a lot to do more uh, journaling in the morning. Yes, huge. And uh, I got to say, when I first started, I thought this is corny stuff. Mm -hmm. But I really, somebody a while back, I wished them a happy birthday. And I said, and I said, I really look up to you and admire you. And they responded in a text and they said, Sean, coming from such a spiritual and connected person, that That's means so much and That's I was like oh do you know now my journaling always starts off with that comment that you're a spiritual connected person yes. and because it touched me it made me feel so good that somebody saw me that way and now when I start my day off if it's feeling bad and I say that to myself it switches so I'm really if people think this is corny stuff I say try it for a week, man, and you will see the difference. 100%. So there's a couple of things. First of all, congratulations on that. Aspect, and thank yeah. you for sharing that. And let me actually add a little uh, a dabble of my coaching right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. 
what you Coach did, away, man. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> so what you did right there is something that I call the brag book. So I have a personal brag book. Every time somebody gives me a compliment. Brag is in B-R-A-G, bragging. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Bragging. Yes, okay. exactly. So every time like somebody that I respect or just anything gives me this compliment or whatever the case is, I write down my brag book. That should go Very in your cool. brag book. Very cool. Now, there's a reason for this brag book. Because the way our mind is made, our mind always tries to find us the worries or whatever the case is. So when you're in a state, because it's always going to happen, when you're in a state that you go a bit lower in your energy level, you're going down, you're having one of those crappy days, let's call it, and you're just kind of only seeing darkness. You're like, oh my God, I can't do this. How am I going to be able to do this? I'm not a podcaster. I'm this. I'm like all this mm. negativity, right? You break the pattern by picking up your brag book and start reading all the amazing things you've accomplished. And then you're like, wait a minute, Sean, I'm the same human being. Yeah, yeah. So what's this small little thing that's stressing me right now? Not important. We are reframing your structure into a bigger frame and we're getting a different perspective on it. So that's something I just wanted to share with Very you. Very cool. Yeah. That, I, I promise you, man, you I'm starting a brag book. This is why I said I it. Like I do brag. I have no problem That's with what's that. up. I got to write up. it down. Yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> write it down, reread it. And you're like, I can give you I think so many times that that has yeah. literally helped me yeah. in so many ways. Okay, so very cool. Now, importantly, any of us dyslexics, uh, ADHD, we got to start the day off right. We got to start off the day with a little bit of calming the mind, some journaling, yeah. definitely exercise. Yeah. Um, any other particular thing? Because I we got some we got so much to cover here, man. So yes. what's one other thing that perhaps somebody can dig into awesome. to help them in their day? Nutrition? Is there something? What do you think? So right off the bat, you just mentioned that for dyslexic, it's not just for dyslexics; it's for every single. I human totally being. agree. Yeah, I just so wanted I to. Totally agree. My my clients, but we're you the unique crowd. Exactly. So we're only so, looking out for dyslexics because <laughs> nobody has been looking out for us in the past. All right, cool, cool. I'll vibe with that. I'll vibe with that. So, so definitely on that end, uh, so if we talk, like, once again, if you're talking about more structure business-wise and whatever the case is, uh, as a human being, so let's talk about dyslexic or just any human being, first and foremost, you have to understand how you learn. That would be the first thing I would, I would uh, advocate. Understand that are you somebody that learns by reading? Are you somebody that learns by writing? Are you somebody that learns by listening? Are you somebody that learns by talking? Once you figure out how you learn, then start consuming the information that you need mm. in that lane. So uh, as an example, just quickly, yeah. uh, if um, somebody learns better by listening, they should get um, auditory books 100%. rather than reading. I mean, huh. you should always push yourself to read, obviously, but if why fight your weakness exactly. when you can improve your strength? That's, it, that's exactly it. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. So if we're talking about a more practical aspect, first of all, get extreme clarity of who you are as a human being, right? Mm -hmm. All of this. This is what we're talking about, clarity. The number one thing, you want to be a high achiever as a human being, it's clarity. Who you are, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, work on your strengths, and honestly, that's, that's where you're going to go, and leverage other people's talent around you for your weakness and build this great team for this great goal and vision that you guys have. Now, that comes from clarity, and the number one step that you have to take is understand, how do I learn? And for students with learning disabilities or anybody that has any certain type of difficulties, once you understand what your difficulties are, you just have to find a way to Put your talents in front of that and fix it. So let's take an example. You said dyslexic, right? Mm -hmm. You want to read, but you're dyslexic. Fine. Get an audiobook. Right. Beautiful. Right. Buy the book at the same time and start just following it where you're at. Your vocabulary is going to get better. You're going to follow like this. We are very fortunate today to have audiobooks yes. the way they are. The, to yes. consume information like that in your car or on your uh, uh, iPhone. It's it's amazing. It really is. It really is. Um, Okay, so that that's pretty cool stuff. I, I it's it's really hilarious that I can tell you and I are very similar. That I'm trying to I'm trying to corral this conversation, and it wants to go. And so there's so much energy, man. Yeah. And um, okay, so I wanna I wanna ask you something about on in regards to dyslexics because this is something that that I really want to understand a little bit better. Yeah. Let's go. Um, we're when we're young. Well, not not me. We didn't weren't doing diagnosis back in that day. Yeah. But presently, we got a young person who might have mild ADD or dyslexia or something. Yeah. And they go. Remember, I said before, I want to come back to the term of diagnosis. Yes. Or let's go for it. So we have this person who goes in and they're diagnosed. They have a condition. Yeah. Now. I'm just a little bit bugged that we do that because we don't send somebody who's 
academically strong, but has mild tendencies towards poor emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. don't tell them that. We let the academic go about their world, their, their life in this world that's structured to really support the academic model. And we don't give them a label and say, you have poor emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. though. Then they'd walk around with this thing, yeah. this block, yeah. and we have our young people like yourself, like myself, like my daughter, like many people I know who walk around, they say, oh, I have this condition. I was diagnosed. And yeah. I'm like, well, how is that fair? Okay. How is that fair? It's, I mean, it's a bad word. No, fair. No, no, Life's I mean, not fair. I get that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that awesome question, honestly. And this is, there's really two sides of this and there's two ways to go about it. There's people that hate the diagnosis, kind of like you just explained, and some people are okay with it. I'm kind of going to go on the aspect of understand how the game works and play the game. So, oh, I like that. So yeah, right yeah. now in the education system we're in for you to get the help that you need as somebody that's dyslexic or whatever other thing you have ADHD or dysphagia, or whatever the case is, you need to get diagnosed. So you need that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Once you get that diagnosis, then you're going to get certain things that are going to open up to you. So you're going to be allowed to have more time at your exams. You may be allowed to have somebody that's going to write for you. Very good so, so it really is with the game that we're playing. Now, that being said, I have no issues with the diagnosis. Now, this is coming from a very uh, inner perspective and just mm -hmm. talking about myself because I have been always somebody with immense amount of confidence and I've developed that confidence. So I have no issues being diagnosed with that. If anything, I'm running with that, right? Mm -hmm. But I do know that that's a process. That's not how I felt with dyslexia, my whole process. The first time at eight years old, my parents told me, Chris, you're dyslexic and you have to get out of the school that you are right now in the middle of school, you're going to a special school. All I heard was I'm leaving my friends and I'm going to a special school. I'm eight years old. Then I go into the school and I'm like, what's happening, getting a bit more comfortable, realizing that there's so many people like me, I'm not alone, starting to become more used to that environment, starting to become more comfortable with learning disability and what my talents are and what my weaknesses are. After that, once I graduate, the next step was I had a fear of I did not want the other people to know that I'm dyslexic. I didn't want my employers, I don't want my colleagues to know because I did not want to be repressed as somebody that is, let's call it, sorry, stupid in the yeah, eyes of other absolutely. people. As I grew older, I realized that's not the case at all. It's just a different form of learning. Like I mentioned, we have a Ferrari in a chassis of a Honda Civic. All I need to do is learn how to brake. Once I brake, I'm competing against other Honda Civics with shitty Honda Civic motors. I am passing everybody yeah. and people are just looking. That's the real light that you have to go into. So getting the diagnosis, I do believe that in the society that we're in right now, we do need it. But the understanding that it's just a different form of learning. Unfortunately, like I said, in the beginning, we spoke about how do you learn? You use reading, writing, spell, uh, not spelling, reading, writing, uh, speaking, or through listening. Mm -hmm. The education system right now is meant for you to succeed if you are a reader or a writer. Mm -hmm. You could be phenomenal at math, but if I give you the work to do and you have to read the paragraph to find out what the problem is and do to solve it. That was my problem in school. I failed all of my math. There you Remember, go. I don't know if it's still the same. The math exams were structured that we did all the maths in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the last seven questions classically were story problems. Yes. Do you know I didn't even try them? No. Neither. I literally hoped that I passed like in flight, I did everything well. I literally would not even try the story problems. So there you go. There you go. And it's very unfortunate for you specifically and for all the baby boomers because people weren't aware of that situation. So now let's, let's take it back. Imagine you were diagnosed, all right? Mm -hmm. So as a young kid, maybe you're going to go through some emotional difficulties and all that stuff that's going to go with it. But at least you're going to be sitting down in that same class. And instead of you reading that, there's going to be the teacher next to you telling you, hey, Sean, this is what the problem is. This is what you have to do. Literally reading you the, the, yeah. the, the problem. And then you could go and try to solve it. If you're good at math, you're going to pull, you're going to pull right. it off. Right. Then you're at the same length as everybody else. That's it. Yeah. Now, that being said, I truly believe, I truly, truly believe that this is a major advantage as a very young age to fail. Mm -hmm. Because you're learning how to continue and what success is. Failing is not real failing. As long as you get up and you continue, that's all about success. Mm -hmm. It's the only reason I really, like, I'm succeeding as an entrepreneur because I get in and I fail and I fail and I fail, but I just continue. I just become relentless. Yeah, you said dyslexics are relentless. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I love it. I love it so much. That's exactly it. And the, the honest truth is any human being that has gone through any type of difficulty in their life, and that could be 
like I said, learning disabilities, that could be emotional difficulties, that could be a parent health, breaking health out, or, yeah, health, health, anything. Yeah. They are more seasoned as human beings. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And when we're talking about maturity, we usually confine maturity and age. But the real thing is maturity comes a lot with experiences. Absolutely. So at eight years old, getting diagnosed, going through that, or whatever other difficulties, or imagine somebody comes from a poor background, whatever the case is, you are becoming seasoned as a human being. And that's what it comes down to. So as a young man, understanding as a dyslexic that I have to work two times harder than everybody else to come on the same level, that is something that just resonates with me. Not only resonates, but creates all the success that I have and every other people with learning disabilities. And I see just day-to-day -day basis. Like I said, I went to Vanguard, but I'm not only an ex-student, I'm actually the president of their alumni association. So I'm really much involved. I'm a part of their, uh, I'm a part of the, the foundation as well, Vanguard Foundation. So I'm really immersed about this. And I'm with other organizations as well that have to do with learning disabilities. So I see these students every single day and I see how relentless they are. I truly believe in life. You don't need resources. You need to be resourceful. Yeah. You will get those resources. People, I'm listening to you, and uh, I'm thinking people who are listening are like, come on, he's not dyslexic. Come <laughs> on, he doesn't have it. Because you're formulating your thoughts perfectly. Yeah, you're making sense. You're not all over the board while you're explaining yeah. what you're thinking. So uh, how, how do you show people out there and teach them Obviously, your morning rituals were key and learning yes. how you learn, yes. learning how yes. you best learn. But, uh, it can, man, you, how, how do how, I know how, you're dyslexic? Yeah, yeah, you very, don't very, sound that, it, man. You, know, very, you certainly don't look it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, brother. I really do. <laughs> so here, You know, your thing. socks are both the same color. Yeah. But not today. <laughs> Actually, everybody wears, like, different. So oh, yeah. I can't see it on the screen. I don't know. Did we get it right there? Got my, I think we got yeah. it. Got yeah. my purple socks. But people, uh, young people today, they don't match socks anymore. Yes, it's I'm the very, most hilarious thing. So, so here's the thing. I'm very fashion-oriented. Or we're talking about fashion. <laughs> that's that's that a like, part of my uh, brand and who I am as a human being. Yeah. Like, uh, truly, fashion is a part of my passions. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's a very good question, and thank you very much for that yeah, compliment. Yeah. So let, let's be honest. Like I said, I'm a professional speaker, peak performance business and life coach, and a learning disability advocate. This is not my first podcast. I usually do one podcast a week. I do TV interviews, and I do radio gigs. Yeah. For me to get to this position, I have worked on my craft. Like I said, that speech that I went on and I gave that first time, I have been blessed by the universe with this gift of communication, but I don't sit on that. I can have all the talent in the world, but if I don't work on it, I'm not going to get anywhere. I can, have, can all dyslexic people sound like you right now? Yes, they could become whatever they want. And it's not to sound like me. It's not about me, you, or whatever. It's whatever your gift is. If you're dyslexic and you're supposed to be an author, brother, write. Sister, write. Do what mm -hmm. you got to do to do that. Find the resources to get there, right? So this is my gift. Now, it looks, like I said, thank you very much. And I'm not throwing flowers at myself. Like, it looks impressive, but it's because it's been goes polished. It goes in the bragging book. It goes in the bragging <laughs> book. Thank you. Exactly. I'll write that down, what he told me today. So it goes with understanding what your talent is and working on it. So that's what it is. So I understand that, oh, wait a minute, is this kid really dyslexic? It's very polished the way he's speaking. It's because there's hours and hours into my craft, yeah. studying it, speaking it. And this is what it comes down to the product. But there's a lot of things that gets developed because I was dyslexic, right? Mm -hmm. so let, me, let me just go into it real quick, right? I said I'm very entrepreneurial based. I've run businesses. I help people. Like I coach people that have you know million dollar businesses. And like I help them with that because mm -hmm. I'm very much somebody that systemizes businesses and lives. So when I was young and the teacher used to come into the classroom and say, kids, put yourself in teams of, th even before she finished the word three, I had my head up and I was looking for who reads the best in the class, who writes the best, let's put a team together, mm -hmm. let me delegate to work, the, let me delegate to work and let's get to the great together. That's mm -hmm. delegation 101, entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. When I was in college and I was failing, I used to go see the professor afterwards and I used to negotiate my grade up. I'm like, nah, that's not what I meant. This is what I meant, got the grade up. I was learning how to be an entrepreneur without even knowing it because I had no choice to succeed in the education system that I was given. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, it was developing other talents. So this is why my communication skills have been developing for years and years because I could not rely on my reading and writing. Mm -hmm. So when I go in front of the teacher and negotiate my grade up, I have to look like I'm making sense. Yeah. I have to look like my thoughts are making sense and there's a pattern behind it. Well, that's why I asked you about um, can anybody who ADD or dyslexic 
be like you have this. Be, I ask that because my primary concern is that until the system changes, yeah. right now it's really put in, it's set up for yeah. people who are academically inclined mm-hmm. and because of that, people who have a dyslexia or ADHD. <laughs> oh, fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> you you saw are, that live. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't go on the equipment. <laughs> for the people that are yeah, listening, yeah, I just but, spilled coffee all yeah, over the table on his beautiful Good stuff. catch there. I wouldn't have thought I, about that. <laughs> yeah, Sorry about that. No, that's fine, dude. And um, I think that for people who are, say, dyslexic and ADHD, they are in a system that's not ready to receive them. Yeah. And... and I'm concerned that they will always turn towards jobs like, and this is nothing like you were going to be a fireman. Damn it, man. We need firemen. And I think it's awesome. I think it's very important that that's somebody's passion. However, I'm concerned that there could be people who have these great skills and talents, but because they don't get through the school system, they might have been, you know, I always think a doctor, you know, if you want to be a a general practitioner, um, and you need to pass physics. I mean, like we need people with great bedside manner who can think through a condition, think, mm-hmm. think on the spot, mm-hmm. diagnose. And I'm not really sure physics and, you know, uh, um, this, all of the sciences are the best determinants for some of these types of positions that people who are dyslexic and ADHD might do very well. hundred percent, man. I mean, there's so much to unpack there and, I'm just going to unframe it and frame it in a bigger box right there. We're talking about human beings right there. We're not only talking about dyslexic, right? As I said, the only living creatures on this planet that have the capability and sometimes don't live to their fullest potential are human beings. A tree will grow to its maximum capacity. A flower will grow. A dog will be a dog. A human being can be not maximized his talents and his potential. We see it every single day. So it's not only with students with learning disabilities. Maybe it's somebody that is in a poor neighborhood. Maybe they are the doctors, but they're not. Their environment's not helping them for that. If you go in the graveyard, there's somebody that said this, the greatest ideas and the greatest books that haven't been written are in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. So as human beings, we have to be acutely aware of that and try to live to the maximum of our potential. But that's 100% correct. Now we're talking about all the good side of learning disabilities and like people that are succeeding from that. But there's a lot of people in the judicial system that are dyslexic Mm -hmm. because they were in school and then they realized that they're not doing great. They don't want to be made fun of. So maybe they acted up in the back of the class. They get kicked out. They start hanging out with the wrong people, start doing some stuff illegally, end up in uh, the judicial system. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that. Like if I'm not mistaken, like I'm, I'm not going to round up like or say random uh, percentages, but a very high percentage of people in the United States prisons all have certain uh, learning disabilities. Mm-hmm. Because if you start at a young age to hang out around crowd, maybe certain things happen. So that's not only just with dyslexia, but that's just with human like people in general, right? Yeah. So what? Let's talk about that kid in the back of the class right now because yeah. I'm I'm like yourself, a solutions person, yes. and. If you suspect that your kid has dyslexia and ADHD and they're misbehaving, what can a public school person do who doesn't have the resources? Okay, that's first they got to care, obviously, right? Yeah, that's 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 an amazing, amazing question, honestly. And let me just frame one thing real quick over there. So, if we're talking about Vanguard specifically, like we said in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, that school does have a lot of plans for um, people that don't have financial yes. aid. So if you, if your kid has some difficulties, just try, try to reach out to them and there's ways to get it done. Obviously, it's pretty full though. Why? It's I extremely it's full. full. We're trying to do our best with, you know, getting the most clientele, like most students in the class. But because there is a special uh, school, we want to max, not maximize, but cap our student ratio per teacher ratio. So instead of having 30, 40 kids in a class, we have like 15, 16 kids per one teacher, because that's the experience that you need as well to succeed. So yes, there are some limitations with that. Now, that being said, on a more external base that we said, like not only over here, what can you do when you start realizing that your, your kid has some difficulties? I mean, the greatest thing to do is go to your local, is to start off with the school, find, tell them, you know, this is the situation. What can we do? What we cannot do? And it's really to teach the kid how to learn and, you know, to make their talents in front in different levels. So if the kid is good in sports, put him maybe in sports. Try to channel his energy in a different way as well. Because if you're talking about this kid that's in the background acting up, it's because he's having a hard time 
using his talents for that specific task of being in school, reading, writing, or whatever the case is, math and all that stuff. So just understanding that and trying to play in the kid's strengths is going to help up build his confidence. And then from there, you're going to be able to leverage one thing over another and just victory over victory. And then you build hopefully a great human being. Mm -hmm. So the greatest thing I could say, just go in your local area or local, uh, like, you know, schooling system and ask them those questions and try to figure out what you can do. Like we said, we're extremely blessed. Now, now, now in 2019, we have podcasts, we have YouTube channels, we have Google, all information is pretty much out there. So you could acquire it from left and right over there and just try to put your kid in the proper state for him really not to learn things, but learn how to learn. Yeah. That's the real important thing because you learn differently. I learn differently. If you understand how it is beautiful. Yeah. Well, do you have strong opinions on medication? Uh, I really don't. So, I'm not sure I wanted to go there with it. I, I, I literally only just thought of it. Yeah, now no, it's good. I, I'm glad you brought it up. So strong opinions. I do not have strong opinions on it. I have my personal opinions. I could tell let's you. Let's go story. with your personal. Yeah. Man. So if we go like with my experiences as a young man, like obviously uh, hyperactive, I remember my parents got uh, offered for me to go on uh, pills. I think it was Ritalin back in the day to calm it down and all that stuff. And I think I just took it for a week. And my parents were like, no, nah, this is not something we want to do to our kid or whatever the case is. So this was my journey. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, I know specifically kids, people, adults that take it. And it is amazing for yeah, them. Very professionally so, said. I exactly. really appreciate so it, you acknowledging so that. So it yeah. really is case by case. Right. We can't generalize it. We can't like, well, there's dude, a place. I'm, gl I'm, gl I'm just interrupting you yeah, for a second because I'm glad you said that because the opinions are so severe out there. Yeah. Your kid should not be on that's, this. And I'm like, like, man, it's like you can't. No, you can't. Life doesn't work so black and exactly. white and people get terribly exactly. uncomfortable with gray. So that comes down to empathy. Mm -hmm. You have to have empathy to the person in front of you and understand. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's your situation and yeah, cool, don't give your kid. That's cool. That's yeah. for you. That's for your kid. But I do know some people that need it and that helps. It's kind of like the explanation between Western medicine and Eastern medicine, right? Mm -hmm. There is place for both, but mm -hmm. to be either too much on the left or too much on the right for any situation, I don't think is the way to go about it. Like you said, there's yeah. some gray zones. So this is the same situation. It really right. goes per person. Uh, I truly believe there's ways and forms to learn how to work with certain things. And just to add upon, you know, previously you, you mentioned that, oh my God, how can we uh, say that you're dyslexic or whatever the case is? <laughs> there's levels of dyslexia. So maybe some people will say, oh, maybe he's not very much dyslexic. Like on a scale of not like, you know, zero to 10, 10 being extremely dyslexic, I'm probably 30 on 10. I'm not, not like no yeah, joke dyslexic, yeah. right? So it really depends on the situation that you have as well. So some people might need some pills, some people might not. So it really depends right. per person, per kid, per situation, per family life as well. Until the system works and really takes treats kids on a per person basis, mm -hmm. they'll have to probably navigate it somehow, whether it be through medication or at least get them to an age where they get the maturity to mm -hmm. now, but then the bad habits are in, right? If we oh, wait yeah. for somebody to get older, to get them off their medication and start practicing something, the bad habits are already in. It really is, like I said, it really depends on the kid best thing to do is try it out if it works it works doesn't work it doesn't work test it but there's other ways to go about it as well maybe structure it before doing that maybe let's try to get them uh you know waste certain energy do an activity that's going to start developing other hormones because i truly believe everything we need to fix ourselves is all within mm -hmm. so if yeah. you could use the inner power that we have to help everybody in whatever the case is let's try with that first and if it doesn't work then maybe go through something else but yeah that's what the that answer would be essentially. Yeah. Uh, there's just so much to go into. <laughs> I think we need to do a second episode. <laughs> we could definitely look at that. Listen, yeah. man, um, there's a lot of questions I have, honestly, and I, I do mean it. I think we're going to have to do a, a round two on this. It'll be my um, pleasure. Yeah. Christopher, I really want to thank you for coming in here live. Uh, very insightful. So much to bring forward. And we're going we're gonna to follow this up, man. So thank my, you so my, much. My pleasure, Sean. It definitely was a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to spill coffee all over your beautiful set. We're going to clean about that. It, it is <laughs> fine, man. We're, so, we're good. So yeah, it definitely was a awesome. And yeah, let's let's set up another time. We'll work it out on a schedule. Right, it's been my pleasure. All right, my man. All right, well, thank you so much. No problem. And thanks for all you guys out there. Have an awesome day. All right.